Sons and Lovers by D. H. Lawrence. Chapter Seven, Part Three. On the Easter Monday, the same party took an excursion to Wingfield Manor. It was great excitement to Miriam to catch a train at Sethley Bridge, amid all the bustle of the bank holiday crowd. They left the train at Alfreton. Paul was interested in the street and in the colliers with their dogs. Here was a new race of miners. Miriam did not live till they came to the church. They were all rather timid of entering, with their bags of food, for fear of being turned out. Leonard, a comic, thin fellow, went first. Paul, who would have died rather than to be sent back, went last. The place was decorated for Easter. In the font hundreds of white narcissi seemed to be growing. The air was dim and coloured from the windows, and thrilled with a subtle scent of lilies and narcissi. In that atmosphere Miriam's soul came into a glow. Paul was afraid of the things he mustn't do, and he was sensitive to the feel of the place. Miriam turned to him. He answered. They were together. He would not go beyond the communion rail. She loved him for that. Her soul expanded into prayer beside him. He felt the strange fascination of shadowy religious places. All his latent mysticism quivered into life. She was drawn to him. He was a prayer along with her. Miriam very rarely talked to the other lads. They at once became awkward in conversation with her. So usually she was silent. It was past midday when they climbed the steep path to the manor. All things shone softly in the sun, which was wonderfully warm and enlivening. Celandines and violets were out. Everybody was tip-top full with happiness. The glitter of the ivy, the soft, atmospheric grey of the castle walls, the gentleness of everything near the ruin, was perfect. The manor is of hard, pale grey stone, and the other walls are blank and calm. The young folk were in raptures. They went, in trepidation, almost afraid that the delight of exploring this ruin might be denied them. In the first courtyard, within the high broken walls, were farm carts, with their shafts lying idle on the ground, the tires of the wheels brilliant with gold-red rust. It was very still. All eagerly paid their sixpences, and went timidly through the fine clean arch of the inner courtyard. They were shy. Here on the pavement, where the hall had been, an old thorn-tree was budding. All kinds of strange openings and broken rooms were in the shadow around them. After lunch they set off once more to explore the ruin. This time the girls went with the boys, who could act as guides and expositors. There was one tall tower in a corner, rather tottering, where they say Mary Queen of Scots was imprisoned. "'Think of the Queen going up here!' said Miriam, in a low voice, as she climbed the hollow stairs. "'If she could get up,' said Paul, "'for she had rheumatism like anything. I reckon they treated her rottenly.' "'You don't think she deserved it?' asked Miriam. "'No, I don't. She was only lively.' They continued to mount the winding staircase. A high wind, blowing through the loopholes, went rushing up the shaft, and filled the girl's skirts like a balloon, so that she was ashamed, until he took the hem of her dress, and held it down for her. He did it perfectly simply, as he would have picked up her glove. She remembered this always. Round the broken top of the tower the ivy bushed out, old and handsome. Also, there were a few chill gillivers, in pale cold bud. Miriam wanted to lean over for some ivy, but he would not let her. Instead, she had to wait behind him, and take from him each spray as he gathered it and held it to her, each one separately, in the purest manner of chivalry. The tower seemed to rock in the wind. They looked over miles and miles of wooded country, and country with gleams of pasture. The crypt underneath the manor was beautiful, and in perfect preservation. Paul made a drawing. Miriam stayed with him. She was thinking of Mary, Queen of Scots, looking with her strained, hopeless eyes, that could not understand misery, over the hills whence no help came, or sitting in this crypt, 
being told of a god as cold as the place she sat in. They set off again gaily, looking round on their beloved manor that stood so clean and big on its hill. "'Supposing you could have that farm,' said Paul to Miriam. "'Yes!' "'Wouldn't it be lovely to come and see you?' They were now in the bare country of stone walls, which he loved, and which, though only ten miles from home, seemed so foreign to Miriam. The party was straggling. As they were crossing a large meadow that sloped away from the sun, along a path embedded with innumerable tiny glittering points, Paul, walking alongside, laced his fingers in the strings of the bag Miriam was carrying, and instantly she felt Annie behind, watchful and jealous. But the meadow was bathed in a glory of sunshine, and the path was jewelled, and it was seldom that he gave her any sign. She held her fingers very still among the strings of the bag, his fingers touching, and the place was golden as a vision. At last they came into the straggling grey village of Critch, that lies high. Beyond the village was the famous Critch stand that Paul could see from the garden at home. The party pushed on. Great expanse of country spread around and below. The lads were eager to get to the top of the hill. It was capped by a round knoll, half of which was now cut away, and on the top of which stood an ancient monument, sturdy and squat, for signalling in old days far down into the level lands of Nottinghamshire and Leicestershire. It was blowing so hard, high up there in the exposed place, that the only way to be safe was to stand nailed by the wind to the side of the tower. At their feet fell the precipice where the limestone was quarried away. Below was a jumble of hills and tiny villages, Maddock, Ambergate, Stony Middleton. The lads were eager to spy out the church of Bestwood, far away among the rather crowded country on the left. They were disgusted that it seemed to stand on a plain. They saw the hills of Derbyshire fall into the monotony of the Midlands that swept away south. Miriam was somewhat scared by the wind, but the lads enjoyed it. They went on, miles and miles, to Whitstanwell. All the food was eaten, everybody was hungry, and there was very little money to get home with. But they managed to procure a loaf and a currant loaf, which they hacked to pieces with shut knives, and ate sitting on the wall near the bridge, watching the bright Derwent rushing by, and the brakes from Matlock pulling up at the inn. Paul was now pale with weariness. He had been responsible for the party all day, and now he was done. Miriam understood, and kept close to him, and he left himself in her hands. They had an hour to wait at Ambergate Station. Trains came, crowded with excursionists returning to Manchester, Birmingham, and London. "'We might be going there. Folk easily might think we're going that far,' said Paul. They got back rather late. Miriam, walking home with Geoffrey, watched the moon rise big and red and misty. She felt something was fulfilled in her. She had an elder sister, Agatha, who was a schoolteacher. Between the two girls was a feud. Miriam considered Agatha worldly, and she wanted herself to be a schoolteacher. One Saturday afternoon Agatha and Miriam were upstairs dressing. Their bedroom was over the stable. It was a low room, not very large, and bare. Miriam had nailed on the wall a reproduction of Veronese's St. Catherine. She loved the woman who sat in the window, dreaming. Her own windows were too small to sit in. But the front one was dripped over with honeysuckle and Virginia creeper, and looked upon the tree-tops of the oak wood across the yard, while the little back window, no bigger than a handkerchief, was a loophole to the east, to the dawn beating up against the beloved round hills. The two sisters did not talk much to each other. Agatha, who was fair and small and determined, had rebelled against the home atmosphere, against the doctrine of the other cheek. She was out in the world now, in a fair way to be independent, and she insisted on worldly values, on appearance, on manners, on position which Miriam would fain have ignored. Both girls liked to be upstairs, out of the way, when Paul came. They preferred to come running down, open the stair-foot door, 
and see him watching, expectant of them. Miriam stood painfully pulling over her head a rosary he had given her. It caught in the fine mesh of her hair. But at last she had it on, and the red-brown wooden beads looked well against her cool brown neck. She was a well-developed girl, and very handsome. But in the little looking-glass nailed against the whitewashed wall, she could only see a fragment of herself at a time. Agatha had bought a little mirror of her own, which she propped up to suit herself. Miriam was near the window. Suddenly she heard the well-known click of the chain, and she saw Paul fling open the gate, push his bicycle into the yard. She saw him look at the house, and she shrank away. He walked in a nonchalant fashion, and his bicycle went with him as if it were a live thing. "'Paul's come!' she exclaimed. "'Aren't you glad?' asked Agatha, cuttingly. Miriam stood in amazement and bewilderment. "'Well, aren't you?' she asked. "'Yes, but I'm not going to let him see it, and think I wanted him.' Miriam was startled. She heard him putting his bicycle in the stable underneath, and talking to Jimmy, who had been a pit-horse, and who was seedy. "'Well, Jimmy, my lad, how art her? Nubbit sick and sadly like? Why, then, it's a shame, my old lad.' She heard the rope run through the hole as the horse lifted its head from the lad's caress. How she loved to listen when he thought only the horse could hear! But there was a serpent in her Eden. She searched earnestly in herself to see if she wanted Paul Morrill. She felt there would be some disgrace in it. Full of twisted feeling, she was afraid she did want him. She stood self-convicted. Then came an agony of new shame. She shrank within herself in a coil of torture. Did she want Paul Morrill? And did he know she wanted him? What a subtle infamy upon her! She felt as if her whole soul coiled into knots of shame. Agatha was dressed first, and ran downstairs. Miriam heard her greet the lad gaily, knew exactly how brilliant her grey eyes became with that tone. She herself would have felt it bold to have greeted him in such wise. Yet there she stood under the self-accusation of wanting him, tied to that stake of torture. In bitter perplexity she kneeled down and prayed, "'O oh Lord, let me not love Paul Morrill. Keep me from loving him, if I ought not to love him.' Something anomalous in the prayer arrested her. She lifted her head and pondered. How could it be wrong to love him? Love was God's gift, and yet it caused her shame. That was because of him, Paul Morrill. But then it was not his affair, it was her own, between herself and God. She was to be a sacrifice. But it was God's sacrifice, not Paul Morrill's or her own. After a few minutes she hid her face in the pillow again, and said, "'But, Lord, if it is Thy will that I should love him, make me love him, as Christ would, who died for the souls of men.' Make me love him splendidly, because he is thy son." She remained kneeling for some time, quite still, and deeply moved. Her black hair against the red squares and the lavender sprig squares of the patchwork quilt. Prayer was almost essential to her. Then she fell into that rapture of self-sacrifice, identifying herself with the God who was sacrificed which gives to so many human souls their deepest bliss. When she went downstairs, Paul was lying back in an armchair, holding forth with much vehemence to Agatha, who was scorning a little painting he had brought to show her. Miriam glanced at the two, and avoided their levity. She went into the parlour to be alone. It was tea-time before she was able to speak to Paul, and then her manner was so distant he thought he had offended her. Miriam discontinued her practice of going each Thursday evening to the library in Bestwood. After calling for Paul regularly during the whole spring, a number of trifling incidents and tiny insults from his family awakened her to their attitude towards her, and she decided to go no more. So she announced to Paul one evening she would not call at his house again for him on Thursday nights. Why? he asked, very short. 
nothing. Only I'd rather not. Very well. But, she faltered, if you'd care to meet me, we could still go together. Meet you where? Somewhere. Where you like. I shan't meet you anywhere. I don't see why you shouldn't keep calling for me. But if you won't, I don't want to meet you. So the Thursday evenings which had been so precious to her, and to him, were dropped. He worked instead. Mrs. Morel sniffed with satisfaction at this arrangement. He would not have it that they were lovers. The intimacy between them had been kept so abstract, such a matter of the soul, all thought and weary struggle into consciousness, that he saw it only as a platonic friendship. He stoutly denied there was anything else between them. Miriam was silent, or else she very quietly agreed. He was a fool who did not know what was happening to himself. By tacit agreement they ignored the remarks and insinuations of their acquaintances. "'We aren't lovers, we are friends,' he said to her. "'We know it. Let them talk. What does it matter what they say?' Sometimes, as they were walking together, she slipped her arm timidly into his. But he always resented it, and she knew it. It caused a violent conflict in him. With Miriam he was always on the high plane of abstraction, when his natural fire of love was transmitted into the fine stream of thought. She would have it so. If he were jolly and, as she put it, flippant, she waited till he came back to her, till the change had taken place in him again, and he was wrestling with his own soul, frowning, passionate in his desire for understanding. And in this passion for understanding her soul lay close to his, she had him all to herself. But he must be made abstract first. Then, if she put her arm in his, it caused him almost torture. His consciousness seemed to split, the place where she was touching him ran hot with friction. He was one internecine battle, and he became cruel to her because of it. One evening in midsummer Miriam called at the house, warm from climbing. Paul was alone in the kitchen. His mother could be heard moving about upstairs. "'Come and look at the sweet peas,' he said to the girl. They went into the garden. The sky behind the townlet and the church was orange-red. The flower-garden was flooded with a strange warm light that lifted every leaf into significance. Paul passed along a fine row of sweet peas, gathering a blossom here and there, all cream and pale blue. Miriam followed, breathing the fragrance. To her, flowers appealed with such strength she felt she must make them part of herself. When she bent and breathed a flower, it was as if she and the flower were loving each other. Paul hated her for it. There seemed a sort of exposure about the action, something too intimate. When he had got a fair bunch, they returned to the house. He listened for a moment to his mother's quiet movement upstairs. Then he said, "'Come here. Let me pin them in for you.' He arranged them two or three at a time in the bosom of her dress, stepping back now and then to see the effect. "'You know,' he said, taking the pin out of his mouth, "'a woman ought always to arrange her flowers before her glass.' Miriam laughed. She thought flowers ought to be pinned in one's dress without any care. That Paul should take pains to fix her flowers for her was his whim. He was rather offended at her laughter. "'Some women do, those who look decent,' he said. Miriam laughed again, but mirthlessly, to hear him thus mix her up with women in a general way. From most men she would have ignored it, but from him it hurt her. He had nearly finished arranging the flowers when he heard his mother's footstep on the stairs. Hurriedly he pushed in the last pin and turned away. "'Don't let Mater know,' he said. Miriam picked up her books and stood in the doorway, looking with chagrin at the beautiful sunset. She would call for Paul no more, she said. "'Good evening, Mrs. Morel,' she said in a deferential way. She sounded as if she felt she had no right to be there. "'Oh, 
"'Is it you, Miriam?' replied Mrs. Morel coolly. But Paul insisted on everybody's accepting his friendship with the girl, and Mrs. Morel was too wise to have any open rupture. It was not till he was twenty years old that the family could ever afford to go away for a holiday. Mrs. Morel had never been away for a holiday, except to see her sister, since she had been married. Now at last Paul had saved enough money, and they were all going. There was to be a party, some of Annie's friends, one friend of Paul's, a young man in the same office where William had previously been, and Miriam. It was great excitement writing for rooms. Paul and his mother debated it endlessly between them. They wanted a furnished cottage for two weeks. She thought one week would be enough, but he insisted on two. At last they got an answer from Maplethorpe, a cottage such as they wished, for thirty shillings a week. There was immense jubilation. Paul was wild with joy for his mother's sake. She would have a real holiday now. He and she sat at evening, picturing what it would be like. Annie came in, and Leonard, and Alice, and Kitty. There was wild rejoicing and anticipation. Paul told Miriam. She seemed to brood with joy over it. But the Morrill's house rang with excitement. They were to go on Saturday morning by the seven train. Paul suggested that Miriam should sleep at his house, because it was so far for her to walk. She came down for supper. Everybody was so excited that even Miriam was accepted with warmth. But almost as soon as she entered the feeling in the family became close and tight. He had discovered a poem by Jean Ingelow which mentioned Maplethorpe, and so he must read it to Miriam. He would never have got so far in the direction of sentimentality as to read poetry to his own family. But now they condescended to listen. Miriam sat on the sofa, absorbed in him. She always seemed absorbed in him, and by him, when he was present. Mrs. Morel sat jealously in her own chair. She was going to hear also. And even Annie and the father attended, Morel with his head cocked on one side, like somebody listening to a sermon and feeling conscious of the fact. Paul ducked his head over the book. He had got now all the audience he cared for, and Mrs. Morel and Annie almost contested with Miriam who should listen best and win his favour. He was in very high feather. "'But,' interrupted Mrs. Morel, "'what is the bride of Enderby that the bells are supposed to ring?' "'It's an old tune they used to play on the bells for a warning against water. I suppose the bride of Enderby was drowned in a flood,' he replied. He had not the faintest knowledge what it really was, but he would never have sunk so low as to confess that to his womenfolk. They listened and believed him. He believed himself.' "'And the people know what that tune meant?' said his mother. "'Yes, just like the Scotch when they heard the flowers of the forest, and when they used to ring the bells backward for alarm.' "'How?' said Annie. "'A bell sounds the same whether it's rung backwards or forwards.' "'But,' he said, "'if you start with the deep bell and ring up to the high one, do 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 he ran up the scale. Everybody thought it clever. He thought so, too. Then, waiting a minute, he continued the poem. Hm, said Mrs. Morel curiously, when he finished. "'But I wish everything that's written weren't so sad.' "'I cannot see what they want drowning themselves for,' said Morel. There was a pause. Annie got up to clear the table. Miriam rose to help with the pots. "'Let me help to wash up,' she said. "'Certainly not!' cried Annie. "'You sit down again. There aren't many.' And Miriam, who could not be familiar and insist, sat down again to look at the book with Paul. He was master of the party, his father was no good, and great tortures he suffered lest the tin box should be put out at Fursby instead of at Maplethorpe. And he wasn't equal to getting a carriage. His bold little mother did that. "'Here!' she cried to a man, "'Here!' Paul and Annie got behind the rest, convulsed with shamed laughter. "'How much will it be to drive to Brook Cottage?' said Mrs. Morel. Two shillings.' 
"'Why, how far is it?' "'A good way.' "'I don't believe it,' she said. But she scrambled in. There were eight crowded in one old seaside carriage. "'You see,' said Mrs. Morel, "'it's only threepence each, and if it were a tram-car—' They drove along. Each cottage they came to, Mrs. Morel cried, "'Is it this? Now this is it!' Everybody sat breathless. They drove past. There was a universal sigh. "'I'm thankful it wasn't that brute,' said Mrs. Morel. "'I was frightened.' They drove on and on. At last they descended at a house that stood alone over the dyke by the high road. There was wild excitement because they had to cross a little bridge to get into the front garden. But they loved the house that lay so solitary, with a sea-meadow on one side, an immense expanse of land patched in white barley, yellow oats, red wheat, and green root crops, flat and stretching level to the sky. Paul kept accounts. He and his mother ran the show. The total expenses, lodging, food, everything, was sixteen shillings a week per person. He and Leonard went bathing in the mornings. Morel was wandering abroad quite early. "'You, Paul?' his mother called from the bedroom. "'Eat a piece of bread and butter.' "'All right,' he answered. And when he got back he saw his mother presiding in state at the breakfast-table. The woman of the house was young. Her husband was blind, and she did laundry work. So Mrs. Morel always washed the pots in the kitchen and made the beds. "'But you said you'd have a real holiday,' said Paul. "'And now you work.' "'Work?' she exclaimed. "'What are you talking about?' He loved to go with her across the fields to the village and the sea. She was afraid of the plank bridge, and he abused her for being a baby. On the whole he stuck to her as if he were her man. Miriam did not get much of him, except, perhaps, when all the others went to the coons. Coons were insufferably stupid to Miriam, so he thought they were to himself also, and he preached priggishly to Annie about the fatuity of listening to them. Yet he, too, knew all their songs, and sang them along the roads roisterously, and if he found himself listening, the stupidity pleased him very much. Yet to Annie he said, "'Such rot! There isn't a grain of intelligence in it. Nobody with more gumption than a grasshopper could go and sit and listen.' And to Miriam he said, with much scorn of Annie and the others, I suppose they're at the coons. It was queer to see Miriam singing coon songs. She had a straight chin that went in a perpendicular line from the lower lip to the turn. She always reminded Paul of some sad Botticelli angel when she sang, even when it was, Come down lover's lane for a walk with me, talk with me. Only when he sketched or at evening when the others were at the coons, she had him to herself. He talked to her endlessly about his love of horizontals, how they, the great levels of sky and land in Lincolnshire, meant to him the eternity of the will, just as the bowed Norman arches of the church, repeating themselves, meant the dogged leaping forward of the persistent human soul. On and on, nobody knows where in contradiction to the perpendicular lines and to the Gothic arch, which, he said, leaped up at heaven and touched the ecstasy and lost itself in the divine. Himself, he said, was Norman. Miriam was Gothic. She bowed in consent even to that. One evening he and she went up the great sweeping shore of sand towards Thettlethorpe. The long breakers plunged and ran in a hiss of foam along the coast. It was a warm evening. There was not a figure but themselves on the far reaches of sand, no noise but the sound of the sea. Paul loved to see it clanging at the land. He loved to feel himself between the noise of it and the silence of the sandy shore. Miriam was with him. Everything grew very intense. It was quite dark when they turned again. The way home was through a gap in the sand hills, and then along a raised grass road between two dikes. The country was black and still. From behind the sand-hills came the whisper of the sea. 
Paul and Miriam walked in silence. Suddenly he started. The whole of his blood seemed to burst into flame, and he could scarcely breathe. An enormous orange moon was staring at them from the rim of the sand hills. He stood still, looking at it. Ah! cried Miriam when she saw it. He remained perfectly still, staring at the immense and ruddy moon, the only thing in the far-reaching darkness of the level. His heart beat heavily, the muscles of his arms contracted. "'What is it?' murmured Miriam, waiting for him. He turned and looked at her. She stood beside him, forever in shadow. Her face, covered with the darkness of her hat, was watching him unseen. But she was brooding. She was slightly afraid, deeply moved and religious. That was her best state. He was impotent against it. His blood was concentrated like a flame in his chest. But he could not get across to her. There were flashes in his blood, but somehow she ignored them. She was expecting some religious state in him. Still yearning, she was half aware of his passion, and gazed at him, troubled. "'What is it?' she murmured again. "'It's the moon,' he answered, frowning. "'Yes,' she assented. "'Isn't it wonderful?' She was curious about him. The crisis was past. He did not know himself what was the matter. He was naturally so young, and their intimacy was so abstract. He did not know he wanted to crush her on to his breast to ease the ache there. He was afraid of her. The fact that he might want her as a man wants a woman had in him been suppressed into a shame. When she shrank in her convulsed, coiled torture from the thought of such a thing, he had winced to the depths of his soul. And now this purity prevented even their first love-kiss. It was as if she could scarcely stand the shock of physical love, even a passionate kiss, and then he was too shrinking and sensitive to give it. As they walked along the dark fen meadow, he watched the moon and did not speak. She plodded beside him. He hated her, for she seemed in some way to make him despise himself. Looking ahead, he saw the one light in the darkness, the window of their lamp-lit cottage. He loved to think of his mother and the other jolly people. "'Well, everybody else has been in long ago,' said his mother as they entered. "'What does that matter?' he cried irritably. "'I can go a walk if I like, can't I?' "'And I should have thought you could get in to supper with the rest,' said Mrs. Morel. "'I shall please myself,' he retorted. "'It's not late. I shall do as I like.' "'Very well,' said his mother, cuttingly. "'Then do as you like.' And she took no further notice of him that evening, which he pretended neither to notice nor to care about, but sat reading. Miriam read also, obliterating herself. Mrs. Morel hated her for making her son like this. She watched Paul growing irritable, priggish, and melancholic. For this she put the blame on Miriam. Annie and all her friends joined against the girl. Miriam had no friend of her own, only Paul. But she did not suffer so much, because she despised the triviality of these other people. And Paul hated her because, somehow, she spoiled his ease and naturalness, and he writhed himself with a feeling of humiliation. End of chapter.